everyone and welcome to this series called Journey to the Boardroom. I'm the CEO and founder of a program called Boardroom Ready and my job is to help those of you who are seeking to get board experience and find non-exec roles, uh, board opportunities or and or where you go and find all these fantastic opportunities out there. And uh, in today's series, uh, I'm gonna, I've am gonna i got the real pleasure of talking to Jessica Jenkins, who actually is a delivery consultant working at Eaton Bridge Partners, specifically in the board practice. And I can't tell you how excited I am to be able to have this conversation because I'm really hoping that we're going to uncover some secrets um, and the insights on how search firms work within the space of non-exec directors and recruiting these lovely people. So Jessica, welcome to this series and thank you so much for your time. Thanks Heather. Right, so what I'd like you to do is can you introduce yourself um, and tell us a bit about the organisation and then we can crack on with some exciting questions. Absolutely, um, so thank you for having me Heather, I'm really pleased to be here and tell you all a bit about Eaton Bridge. Um, so Eaton Bridge was founded in 2010 initially as a a finance firm supporting placement of CFOs and FDs across the UK. From there, we've grown out and we've now got an HR practice, business transformation technology, board practice. And then within that, we've got um, specialisms in operations, logistics, procurement and supply chain, marketing, sales, commercial, and then general counsel and COSEC, to name a few. We've got three I'd say, core business areas. So we've got the executive search side, interim management, uh, which is pretty self-explanatory and then we've also got a new branch which is our consulting arm. Um, um, board practice was set up by Louise Chaplin, she's one of our directors, and initially was a focus on placing C-suite across UK companies, covering anything from private equity, uh, the bottom end of the FTSE and AIM listed. From there we've grown and we now support a, a number of different functions from uh, non-executive director and chair opportunities, the full C-suite function, and probably down to C-suite minus two. So we work on sales directors, marketing directors, ops and procurement directors. Um, in terms of industry, we are incredibly sector agnostic. I'd say the only thing we don't do is sort of pure financial services. Um, but other than that, we, we sort of work across everything and very much now have an international reach as well and that's something we're, we're really driving forward so when i joined eaton bridge about three years ago in a research function i would say probably 90 percent of what i was doing was uk focus um now gosh it varies but probably about 50 to 60 percent is uk and there's there's about 40 to 50 percent international so it's, it's really grown um in terms of locations we've recently placed across well the whole of europe so france spain germany the netherlands we've done a lot in uh, southeast asia a uh, lot in america and more recently canada and then also we have got some some clients we've worked for a while who are in south america as well wow. so really growing that that international footprint and we've just completed our first role over in australia so so definitely making our way across the globe um in terms of sort of eaton bridge and their research function it's something that they've they've really built out over the years and i think it's something that people don't really understand the importance of i would say so when i came in i'm i'm from a different background i, I don't have a, a recruitment background at all um and came in sort of not really understanding it myself and the researchers really are, I would say, in some respects, the heart of an exec search firm, and they are your way in. You've got um. you know, the partners and so it's very, very busy, but it's the researchers who really go out there, initially meet the candidates and champion them through their processes. OK, so this is the first secret then, isn't it? Or the first insight that says, because a lot of people, when they are first um, looking to go to search firms to get their name out there, will tend to go for the partners, you know, the, the big names of the within the organisation. Absolutely. Um, right. OK, so now this is exciting. Tell me then a bit more, a lot more, actually, about one, your particular role in the board practice. Mm. And then tell me about researchers, because when I when we first spoke a little while ago, do you know, I didn't have a clue. So uh, this is seriously exciting for me. Go on. So tell us then how all this how this bit works. So 
now I, I'm a delivery consultant, which is very much a hybrid role. It's a, a cross between research and, and consultant or associate partner, partner, whichever way you want to phrase it. Um, so it's sort of half client, half candidate focus. Whereas the research role is, I would say, 90% candidate focus. So when we get a new role on, it will be the, the consultant and the researcher will be on that initial briefing call, find out all the information that the client needs us to know to, to fill that position. And then the researcher will go away and probably for the first two weeks, three weeks of a search, it sits with the researcher. So they're the one going out looking for the right people, whether that's, you know, we've got various ways of, of finding people we can touch on later. Um, but it does very much sit with the researcher that they are, for instance, say we've got a, a CEO for a pharmaceutical company in the UK, they will go and look at you know, those companies' competitors, um, other people who are in sort of maybe slightly different industries that are aligned and transferable, and they'll be the ones who will do the initial approach, the initial reach out and have that conversation. And it works the same way with, with non-executive directors and chairmen, um, that it will be the researcher. It, it will be someone who's a bit more experienced in their research career. Mm -hmm. So when I started initially, I was working on very much more junior positions. Um, as I've been here longer and I've gained my confidence and I've learned a huge amount, I now tend to, especially on the, the main sort of chair, non-executive director and our heaviest C-suite roles, I'll be the point of, of contact for research, but then also from the delivery aspect too, and working very closely with the clients. Um, but the research function is very much more that candidate focus. So it's, it's very interesting journey. Um, and certainly for anyone who wants to speak to an exec search firm, rather than going to the managing director or the partner or whoever it happens to be, better bet is to go into a researcher because they'll actually have the time to talk to you. And nine times out of 10, if you send your CV over to a partner, they're going to send it to us anyway. Right. And then in which case, then if they send their CV over, then you guys would be doing the follow up rather than the partner necessarily. Absolutely. Right. OK, so you're the people that people need to be networking with. Yeah, actually. It, it, and it probably sounds quite strange. You know, the partners are the ones who have more contact with the clients. But on that initial instance, getting into a company, and getting to know a company as well, mm. it's definitely more beneficial to go to a researcher. And with Eaton Bridge, I mean, you know, the EAs here are fantastic and they pick up and have a chat with anyone. So a lot of the time, if someone gives us a call, they'll then get through to the EA and an EA will pass their details straight on to a researcher, not to the partners. Okay, so that's a really good point, actually. So then um, let's say, for example, someone found Eaton Bridge. They were doing their research and they found Eaton Bridge. How do they then initially find out who the researchers are? Because, you know, quite often most search firms, they don't really overly broadcast who is in the teams and what teams. I mean, I've been doing, I've done a lot of research myself to try and find non-exec recruiters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's hard it's hard I have to say it's almost like a bit of a black magic thing going on out there because it is almost not a secretive that's quite the wrong word but it's difficult to do the research so how do I start um because you know if, if you sort of take it we represent people who are just starting out on their board journey quite often yeah. don't have board experience but they're a head of function or a vp or a c yeah. whatever so they come across your organization how do they find a researcher so on if you go on our website actually we've got a very comprehensive meet the team it lists every single person who works here what we do um i was actually just having a look before we were having a chat and our there is a page you can click on that is meet the researchers our in-house research team um and in there it lists who does what who's on what team it won't necessarily say that it said i'm the person to come to specifically for non-executive director roles but it does say who i'm looking now at, at one of my colleagues it says that she's transformation digital and technology another one is human resources then you've got board practice, which there are four of us now on board practices researchers, soon to be five. Um, and to be honest, if you came through to any one of us, it will get passed on to the right person. And I think that's one of the really nice things about Eaton Bridge actually is whoever you go out to within the company, it will find its way to the right person. We're, we're as much as we're growing quickly, we are a very close knit team. Yeah, I have to sort of say you are one of the better ones in how you promote 
a team so that people know where to go because you know we waste so much time can't we and actually both internally and externally uh just trying to find and track down the right person it's it's a, it's a real challenge okay so now right let's get into so uh let's get into you get a brief from a client saying they were looking for a non-exec yeah um, one of the questions i wanted to ask you on this particular part is that with the research that we've done looking at the advertising mm. in the majority of them actually are looking for experienced non-execs um when that conversation has taken place over the brief mm. um do you guys ever talk about will they be interested in somebody with no board experience or no previous non-exec roles we do yeah and it does vary with every client i mean there are i think especially at the moment with you know what's been going on in the world and you know some companies have got an element of disaster recovery they need someone to come in who has got that experience but we've also got clients who are very open to to that first sort of advisory or mentoring role because they've normally done that at some point in their career but just not as a job title um there's there's one client we're working with at the moment who's a education company and they they said to us you know it's got to be someone who's got ed tech background doesn't have to be someone with board experience or that sort of advisory and mentoring experience it, for them it was about finding the right person and who's going to help with their growth journey um so it does it does very very much on the situation the client situation what what they need and where the support they need as well okay and um and what's the market like at the moment for non-exec recruitment um i know that's probably a difficult one and it's quite a broad question as well but uh, any views on how the market's going i think internal i mean i can speak for Eaton bridge not necessarily the whole market um it is particularly busy at the moment. I think we're finding it across not just the board practice and the non-executive and chair opportunities, but across everything. The market has really picked up. Um, I think there was you know, everything with Brexit and, and COVID did put things on hold and companies are now in a position where they're going, okay, we can start hiring again. There are, you know, there are still some clients who have got positions on hold, but it's, it's buoyant, I would say. And it's very much a candidate led market as well. Ooh. Candidates are in multiple processes and are really having the pick of the crop. Fantastic. Oh, that is really good news, actually. Yeah, it's, now, it's, it's exciting. Okay, so I've got a delicate question to ask you. Okay. Majority of search firms tend not to openly advertise their roles mm. and their job opportunities. Uh, do you have a view as to why that is, why they're not on the open market? I think there's there's multiple different reasons. Um, and there's an element that, you know, the client have approached us because we have an expertise and normally already have quite an extensive network. You know, we've built out our network over the last 11 years, so we wouldn't necessarily have to advertise. Um, I think that's probably the main one. Also an element of confidentiality. You can be as, as broad as you want and not say too much in a, in a job ad but you know people can guess um and that, yeah i'd say those are the two main reasons that that we're being paid for for our expertise we already have a very big network and a very highly qualified network um and i would say the majority of the time we don't actually have a need to advertise because we have an in-house research team and that is our purpose so that you know in some respects would make some of our jobs slightly redundant if we were just putting up job ads all the time that makes sense, actually. So then in which case, how does a researcher go about researching? Now, what I'm keen on is you've, you've obviously got a really extraordinary database of content. Yeah. And I could, so I suppose part of the question then is how much are you looking for fresh people that you've not met before versus how much do you tend to sort of stick within the networks that you've got? So tell me, deep dive into how do you guys go about doing the research? So I think that it does vary depending on team. So for instance, finance, first practice that was established, they have an extensive network of fantastic candidates um, who they can go back to time and time again, or you know they've been in a company for five years and it's time for them to move on and they naturally come back to us because we may have placed them all they may have been a client um for do you want to stop dave sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 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 we 
we might keep that one in and just for uh, you know that looks like fun actually yeah so carry on you were saying uh, about where you go and then i think for other practices um especially the newer practices so i would say for board practice and for business transformation and technology we because we're growing out our network all the time not to say finance or hr aren't but because we are working such a variety of roles we do actively source new people more often i would say um we do you know we've got great candidates who you know are top chaps um who we we try and use as much as we can but it's great not just for our network but for our clients to see fresh people coming through and you know there are people who are getting to later stages of the career and are sort of winding things down a bit and then you know we we need that influx of, of people building out there non-executive portfolios to to keep the well number one the market point but the clients happy and to keep everybody sane and the economy driving yeah so and i should imagine that it extends itself into the diversity aspect as well isn't it absolutely absolutely and i think from the actual research perspective and, and how we find people there's an element yes we've got our network but then we do we use linkedin it is i would say as much as some people hate it it is very important to to the world of recruitment and executive search and interim management i don't think there's any other platform out there that's quite as advanced and easy to use um having said that we've also we've got boardex which is aimed specifically at people who ha have sat on a board before so perhaps not quite right for people who haven't had that board experience um but that's a, a great way and I, I would highly recommend that to, to people who have got board experience to, to join that one. Um, and then there is the AESC, which is the Association of Executive Search Companies, okay. who also okay. have their own sort of in, in-house, I'd say, res research uh, function, I guess, that we can, we can utilise as well as we, as we are one of their members. So and that, that I would say that's more for an international approach. They've got a, a huge international network, whereas in the UK it tends to be more LinkedIn and Bordex. Okay, so let's stay with LinkedIn. My favorite <laughs> subject. Right, okay then. Now a lot of people won't know necessarily about the license that you buy, you yep. license from LinkedIn, which is the recruiter license. Yes. And the uh, facilities, the filter that it offers you, which is quite extraordinary, isn't it? It is, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think what I do is I'll do a screen share at the end of this so that people can just sort of see what you guys can filter on. Now, let's say with LinkedIn, this is one of those love-hate relationships, isn't it? It's absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic search um, platform, absolutely brilliant, It's but it's also has its imperfections too, doesn't it? as ever, every search function yeah. does but yes yeah. so what is the top tip that you would say to people about their linkedin profiles what would be the thing to make sure they come up in a search when you're using the recruiter license it does vary person to person as to how we all use linkedin for me personally and actually the search function in general the way it pulls through information you can do a search on so location job title industry even to, you can specify it to company um education all sorts so if someone if we're working with a client who wants a, a chair of their remco committee for instance and they want someone who has come from a finance background and has specifically worked at a deloitte or an ey we can filter it down to find those exact people so having i would say as much information on there as possible is actually really good i know a lot of people don't want to do that but for us when we see a linkedin profile that essentially reads like a cv and has the keywords of what we would be looking for that pulls through and that's how we find the most suitable candidates a lot of the time um i think there's also an, an element that a, a candidate can say they're open to work which isn't necessarily the, the key one for us that's neither here nor there um but they can also put in there there's a bio bit at the top of the, the screen and you can put you know non-executive director chairman ceo coo and that will then also pull through in the search so it doesn't necessarily have to be in the bit where you put your job title itself and what company you've worked for and you know how many years or whatever it happens to be you can just put that in a bio and it will still pull through okay 
don't realise. Yeah, and that's really interesting because the key word bit is the key bit, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, just to remind everybody, LinkedIn works on algorithms. Algorithms are based oh. on keywords. If you don't have the right keywords in your profile, you just won't come up on a search. Exactly. It's black and white, isn't it? Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, everybody needs to put into their profile the right keywords for the jobs that they're looking for, irrespective of whether or not it's one exec or whatever. Exactly. Um, now, the, the challenge is, though, uh, and I can hear people almost screaming at me to ask this particular question, which is, again, staying on LinkedIn, is that if they don't have board experience, if they don't mm -hmm. have, they've not been a non-exec, yeah. should they still put the words non-exec in their LinkedIn profile, even though they haven't had it? In their, in their bio bit, yes, you can put looking for non-executive director opportunities or building out my non-executive director portfolio and those are the kind of phrases that we at Eaton Bridge certainly look out for um, and I would have thought across the industry as well yeah so absolutely while yeah so the reminder to everybody is I'm going to look straight into camera on this one put in keywords in your LinkedIn profile now what yeah. we normally say to people is go and find a couple of non-exec roles that they would be interested in look at the keywords that you guys use to describe the role and then yep. grab that and assuming you've got that then put that into your profile um, and then make sure you've got the words non-exec in your profile as well to get picked up by the search absolutely so, you know because that's the important thing because if you're not picked up nothing's going to happen exactly we're never going to find you yeah and we'll never have that conversation and it might be that you know, what we're looking for isn't quite right for you yeah but we might have something else in a couple of weeks or months or years that will be and i think with the non-executive portfolio and the chair portfolio it's it, it's not a two three month thing it's a it's years long normally it's you know people can build out that portfolio over 15 years mm. so it's you know it time is sort of irrelevant in, in some respects but yeah. have it having it out there and having that information online for people to see is is never going to do any harm yeah and so and i think that's right for anyone who's going down the non-exec or trustee route is that this is a long-term career program for themselves and Absolutely. It, you know being on registered with you guys and keeping that up to date and fresh is really important okay then right so now i know that i've been doing some introductions uh, to you so yes. what is the best way then for people to get in touch i mean you've got people like me and others who will go look this is a great person you need to talk to jessica so what are you looking for when it comes to introductions i mean are you happy that people approach you cold do you want someone to introduce you first i mean how does it work um personally i am happy either way it, it doesn't it's always nice to have a referral because you you know that it's you know there's a warm conversation to be had um but if someone approaches me directly that that's lovely too and we as eaton bridge we do get back to every single person who contacts us even if it's to say you know very polite thank you but we can't help you it's one of our things is you know it's about the candidate it's not just about the clients mm. it's hugely candidate led what we do and we you know on our interim management team we specifically have candidate managers who are there to, to look after the, the candidates and make sure that everyone you know is responded to so if you're going to approach us and, and pop an email over to myself or any of the other researchers the eas even you know senior management team it will always get responded to that's brilliant because so often they just go disappear a black hole and it's yeah. I mean, and that's disheartening for so many people absolutely right. so now we've got the introduction and mm -hmm. uh, you agree you're going to uh, have a chat with them yeah. and um how do you go about having that initial chat i'd be keen to find out what type of questions do you typically ask and how would you ideally want someone to prepare i mean almost like what is your biggest oh, i wish they wouldn't do that <laughs> uh, as much as that's great that they do that so how does that bit work i think it's different with everybody um and also depending on experience as well so when you're looking at someone who's been a non-executive director or a chair you you don't need to do what know what they did when they left school and most of the time it's completely irrelevant it's more what they've done in their most recent executive roles and what they're looking for 
So with every non-exec role, it varies so much. Um, some of them are you know, pretty hands off. You've got your four quarterly board meetings and you're there essentially as a face tick a box. Um, other ones are a lot more hands on and they want someone who's there you know, one day a week and then on emails and sort of almost that critical friend, I guess, to really support the company in whatever way is needed. But for, for me, it's important knowing what they've, what they've done and their capabilities are um, and what support they can actually provide moving forward. And, and what their areas of strength are. Um, so I'd say those are the mo most important bits. But s some of these conversations, you know, might only be 10 minutes, sort of a brief get to know you. Some of them might go on for an hour, hour and a half. Um, it, d it depends, you know, what's relevant, I would say, and keeping to that. But if you're having an initial conversation, I would rather know more than less. So, right. okay. yeah. So yeah. um, I know for me, when I'm interviewing people, um, one of my uh, slight dreads, mm. and I've learned how to do this differently now. So whereas I used to sort of say, tell me a bit about yourself. I don't do that anymore um, because otherwise I get 30, 40 years experience uh, and yeah. it can go on for a very long time. And um, anyone who does personal brand will say, you know, if you give me more than, um, you know, sort of 10 minutes of conversation, majority of that I'm going to forget anyway. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm not sort of talking about I want a 60 second pitch, but I, what, so what I do is I say to people now, OK, tell me where you are now and what you want to achieve. So yeah. then I go now and future led because that's where I'm best to help people. So Absolutely. in your case, what you need to know is what expertise, experience. I would say probably the last maximum 10 years of what they've been doing, but that it, I'd say the previous five years is very important because it gives us an understanding of, of their capabilities um, and, that, and what they're looking for next. Mm. And having an idea of what that is, the amount of people we talk to who say, oh, well, I don't really know. I just wanted to have a chat and I want your advice, which is absolutely fantastic. And that is also yeah. what we're here for. But when you've got someone who's very broad, doesn't really you know, care what sector it is or you know, what the company do or you know, whether it's a growth agenda or it's mergers and acquisitions or organic growth or divestments, when they've got no idea, that for us is a real challenge. And that's where we're going to have difficulty placing someone because if they're going to be like that with us, how are they going to be with a client? And what are they actually offering? So what do you want them to say instead then? Um, and give me, um, I don't know, an example of, so like a framework or a structure of the components mm -hmm. that where you sort of think, okay, got it, got it, got it. Yeah. What would that look like for you? So for me, I would say five year maximum yeah. 10, career history, but what they've actually been doing in that role that they've enjoyed and they want to continue doing in the future because just because they're coming out potentially of an exec career into this NED portfolio, you need to know what makes them tick. What's interesting, there's no point in building out a non-exec career if you're not doing something that's enjoyable. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that's, that's one of the key things. Um, I think the other is having a really good understanding of the types of companies you want to go into. Mm -hmm. So I will always question someone about company ownership, whether it's family owned, it's private, it's AIM listed, it's FTSE, private equity backed. You really do need to understand exactly what works for you because they are so varied. Mm -hmm. And not knowing that saying, I'll do anything, isn't going to work. Oh, yeah. I mean, it can for the odd person, mm -hmm. but the majority of people do have a specialism. They just haven't necessarily voiced it or even maybe understood it themselves. Mm -hmm. And would you want them also to uh, express any industries or sectors that they are also interested in? From my perspective, I actually always go down the route of anything you're really not interested in. Okay. Which says a lot more about a person than they probably realise. Um, and it gives you a good, a good understanding, definitely. So, yeah, so what someone isn't interested in is always, I'd say, one of the, the best questions um, because it, it gives you a deeper insight. Brilliant. OK, so to finish off, then, uh, yeah. is there anything that you would say to people, you know, uh, do this and avoid this or, you know, do this or don't do that? So yeah. do you think there at all that you would summarise what people should be thinking about doing, saying for you guys? I think one thing is to be clear in what you're looking for. 
have a good understanding of what your next steps look like. And you might not always know that, um, but at least have some foundation is, is very helpful. Um, do you contact exec search firms? And although having said that, a lot of these roles, especially at this level, do go through your own network, word of mouth. So, and again, that can be on LinkedIn. So really utilize LinkedIn. I would say connect with people you come across throughout your career because you never know where they are now and what they're looking for. And if you pop up going, hi, I want to connect. And in your bio, it says I'm looking for non-exec opportunities. You have no idea what they're doing and, and how that might help them as well. Um, and then I would say, yeah, the other thing, really make contact with exec search firms. There are a few of us out there who do do non-exec and chair, not a huge amount because there is so much of it that is word of mouth. Um, but have a chat with as many people as you can. The more people you talk to, the better understanding you'll get of building out that side of your career um, and also understanding what you do and you don't want and what's going to work for you. Brilliant. Jessica, that has been so insightful, so useful, so practical. Thank you very much indeed. I've, this has been an Welcome. absolute joy. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. It's been a pleasure. I wanted to add in an extra part here to confirm part of the conversation I was have, having with Jessica on the LinkedIn recruiter license. And what we talked about was the importance of having the right keywords in your profile so that the LinkedIn algorithms will pick you up. If you don't have the right words in, you simply won't get picked up by the algorithms, which means when they're using the recruiter license, that means that you won't be found um, other than through other means. So where would you put your keywords? Now, there are a couple of places that you can do this. The first one is this bit here underneath your name. So if I zoom into this one, um, you'll be able to see what I mean, which is this bit here. So add in here some keywords. And if you remember, Jessica talked about what you can do in this part. And also you can add um, down in this bit, sorry, down in this bit, you can add in building out a NED portfolio or developing a NED portfolio or I'm an aspiring non-exec. So you can add those types of languages in because the most important part here is that you do get found by the actual algorithms and you need the the language, the key words, which is non-exec director or NED. So those are really important. You can also uh, add in some hashtags as well that might also then uh, start being developed more by LinkedIn. And in order to get these set up, if you come down to your dashboard on here, you've got creator mode. And then that's when you go into this part. It will then you can then type in the hashtags that you want. Um, and then on that basis, see down here uh, you can only add up five sadly but if you then add those in should they be then uh, using tags in this search then obviously that's going to help a lot as well she also talked about open for opportunities and this is where um, if you want to show the recruiters that you are looking for opportunities you can do that there and then you make your own decision whether or not you want to have the green band or just for recruiters eyes only so that's what um, Jessica and I were talking about and the, lab, the other part I said I would show you is a, a sneak a sneak preview if you like of what the LinkedIn recruiter license what the the um, search firms can actually search on so here is a screenshot of what they are they can use it's absolutely brilliant this thing so they can this bit where it says spotlight for example this is where they can then type in uh, open for opportunities they can put in then job titles, which is why you need non-exec director in your LinkedIn profile. Even if you don't have board experience, you can still add it in, building out, building up, inspiring too. Keywords, um, other keywords, places that are critical will be skills and assessments. So on your LinkedIn profile, you can find this part actually belongs to uh, under here. Skills and endorsements. Is, has direct relationship to skills and assessments. So there you go. You can see here they can do an incredible amount of search on the people that they want and really filter that down. I hope that's useful to you and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next interview. Thanks again.